the evolution of photosynthesis. Uh, little on this earth has changed life so much on it as we know it as photosynthesis. Now, what is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is, well, photosynthesis occurs and it can occur through a couple different ways, but for the most part on planet earth, it occurs through chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll, which is a pigment in plants, takes the light from the sun that comes from 93 million miles away, and it takes that light energy and it turns it into chemical bond energy. And it, use, and it does so by breaking water's bonds and then reconfiguring water up with some carbon dioxide that it also inhales, and it turns it into simple sugars, complex sugars like starch or simple sugars, and there it stores the chemical bond energy and then it, you, it leaches out oxygen as a waste product. Then that's the pr process called oxygenic photosynthesis, which is what I'm gonna mostly focus on and how it evolved on this planet. Now on this planet, we did not always have oxygenic photosynthesizers. The original photosynthesizers were likely retinol-based organisms well, there were likely Archean organisms that used the retinol molecule in, bact in bacterial hadospirin. I can't I have such a hard time saying that. Bacterial hadospirin. <laughs> um, and they used it uh, to take the light energy and turn that into chemical bond energy. They did not emit oxygen as a waste product. They were in fact poisoned by oxygen and they also coexisted with cyanobacteria. Um, even, and okay, here you have um, some halobacteria and a picture from an electron microscope and they're colorized of course. And there you have a body of water here now today from Australia, I think it's called Bundi Bundi Lake. There are plenty of lakes in Australia and there's even you know more famous bodies of water like the Red Sea that have tons of halobacteria on it. Now don't be misled by the term halobacteria. Halobacteria is in fact from the Archean domain of life. Um, it is pretty different from bacteria. The only real similarity is that they're small. And halobacteria uses retinol to photosynthesize and cyanobacteria was also doing this but they did not exist in such high abundance um, on the planet to you know 4.4 billion years ago 2.5 billion years ago and somewhere along the way cyanobacteria started to become more successful of living on this planet and they started to emit lots of oxygen and these plumes of oxygen started to kill the cyanobacteria and it is uh, kind of interesting to think about it, though, that if cyanobacteria didn't ever, didn't ever come on the scene, our planet may actually be very blue instead of blue, I'm sorry, purple instead of green on land. Our plants are green and they appear green to us because they reflect all green light. So actually, they're really not green at all. They're all the other colors except green. Um, they're very good at absorbing light from from the purple and blue bands and the red and orange bands. Our sun, which to us looks yellow, but it really is very good at emitting light energy in the green region of the spectrum. Um, obviously the sun is, you know, all of the light, but where it excels and it has a very, very strong peak of energy is around the light. I mean, around the green spectrum. Now, retinol-based photosynthesizers um, are very good at absorbing this green light. They actually have um, and are very inefficient at absorbing pink and red and purple light, which is why it gives them that pink appearance because they reflect that light. So you might be wondering to yourself, how did cyanobacteria become more successful on this planet if halobacteria, which is from Archaea, is much better at processing that green light from our sun. Well, uh, you know, think back to the ancient oceans. Um, there were probably tons of halobacteria, you know, coating the oceans, and you know, a little bit of cyanobacteria here and there. The halobacteria was absorbing 
all of the color of light from the spectrum and the cyanobacteria probably evolved because it was just taking its leftovers. Now it turns out that these leftovers actually made it a little bit better at absorbing, at, at thriving on earth because being too good at absorbing green light has shown in laboratory conditions to actually kind of essentially burn the organism. It becomes, it becomes too, you know, and that's me simplifying things, but it, 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 it's too efficient and it just kind of overheats in a way. Um, you can kind of see here where I have, you know, the, these right here, this green band is where chlorophyll is really good at absorbing light here at the red and here at the blue purple region. Our sun is in yellow, really good at emitting in the green region and retinol, which is really good at, at emitting light in the green, I'm sorry, absorbing light in the green. So essentially it kind of gets like a sunburn. Um, now this kind, this, um, you know, cyanobacteria getting better at, at, at photosynthesizing on our planet started to create a lot of oxygen waste. And this oxygen waste started to build up and kind of form these plumes that wafted over different parts of the planet. And you can actually see this in different iron deposit, ancient iron deposits where it starts to oxidize the iron. And uh, archaea is, uh, is, is poisoned by oxygen. So this also caused a great extinction event, maybe bigger than killed more organisms in a way than, than the meteorite for the dinosaurs because essentially it made our atmosphere poisonous to most of the Archaeans. So they died. Bye-bye, Archaeans. So, okay, cool. So a long time ago, uh, an organism, um, cyanobacteria was king at photosynthesizing and it killed off all the Archaeans. Okay, that's cool. That's good. But how, how does that prokaryote make a jump into eukarya? right? Eukaryotes are much more complex than prokaryotes and bacteria. How, how do we know that it wasn't a heterotrophic um, organism evolved this type of capability on its own? Well, um, there's a little bit of evidence in its cell membrane of a uh, plastid. You have uh, the endo endo endosymbiotic theory where a cyanobacterium was engulfed by a phagosomal host, and this phagosomal host probably did this over and over again, and maybe the cyanobacteria kind of evolved to withstand being inside the host a little longer, and maybe the host got a little comfortable with the cyanobacteria being inside of it because the cyanobacteria was essentially feeding it by photosynthesizing, you know, giving off its waste products. Um, either way, it happened, and it happened about 60 million years ago. And this is the beginning, the our first plastid, really, the prim, what we call a primary plastid. And this primary plastid um, has a double membrane, um, and this double membrane is something that you also see in like mitochondria. And it's 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 a it's a well established theory as to how the chloroplast ended up inside of eukaryotes. Um, there's also a lot of molecular evidence that shows us. Um, that prokaryotes came from, I'm sorry, that eukaryotic photosynthesizers came from, uh, from a single uh, prokaryotic ancestor. Another hint is the light harvesting pigment antenna molecules. Oh, that's a big word. Well, a light, in simple terms, the light harvesting pigment antenna molecules is the pigment molecules in the chlorophyll that kind of bounces around a, um, light energy and exciting electrons and then filtering them off into a reaction center. That happens in photosystem two. And then that takes it over to photosystem one and photosystem one takes, um, takes you know, the products from that and basically makes the sugars. That's again, an over, a gross oversimplification of a very complicated process. Um, in bacteria, we have seven light harvesting reaction centers and eukaryotes only have two and cyanobacteria only have two. And guess what? They're the same ones. So on top of, so supporting the molecular sequencing evidence that we have is the fact that photosystem two and photosystem one exist in all eukaryotic organisms. No eukaryotic photosynthesizing organisms have any other types of photosystems. And these photosystems are chlorophyll based systems. Bacteria has a big mishmash of of seven different ones. They're all kind of like chimeras of them taking, you know, some have taken, some have re, re, 
uh, adapted to, I mean, have retaken up certain, certain pigments and then gotten rid of them and gotten them back. But either way, cyanobacteria has photosystem two and photosystem one, and it, and there's molecular evidence showing that it's, you know, been like that for, for eons. And here you have a phylogenetic tree kind of sh showing that a little bit. You can kind of see the red lines showing the jump. Now this is a very simplified phylogenetic tree. It obviously doesn't have all of life in it. It's kind of just showing the main ancestors to all heterotrophic photosynthesizers on this planet. And as, as you can see, I've colorized them to show you reaction centers one and two, which is the same thing as saying photosystem one and photosystem two. Um, and you can see here that they have the photosystem one and photosystem two. So without, without this endosymbiotic event, life on this planet would have been very different. We may have never had an ozone layer. We, um, you know, would never have food for many of the eukaryotes, so they would have never evolved. And it's kind of fun to think about how the color of the light of our sun really affects how well these reaction centers photosynthesize. So I kind of think it's pretty interesting to think about how if we had if we were to look at life on other planets and they had a different colored sun, maybe it would have more retinol based photosynthesizers on that planet. Maybe if you had something, you know, or something even completely different if you had like, um, but the, there's so much to wonder about really there. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. Photosynthesis. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm Diane Lee Brachelson. Thank you.